I think I first met Uday, I'm going to say four or five years ago, and it was just sort of in a crowd of other UX designers, seasoned UX designers. He was standing in the middle of like Christina Woodkey and maybe Aaron Malone, or one or two other people. And, and so I was like, I don't know who this guy is, but obviously he's one of us, because he's standing in the middle of everybody. And that's uh, social proof, I think is what they call that. And, um, and then we got to know each other, and he's a very cool, excellent guy. And then more, most recent, more recently, we were having a beer the way people sometimes do when they have stuff to commiserate about. In this case, it was sort of doing, trying to make a good product in a startup. Um, and we're very different. My startup is called Cloud On. His is called Cloud Physics. Um, he's, the he's the head of UX, I'm the head of product, totally, totally different, completely unrelated things. Um, but strangely, many, many common interesting problems. And I think, frankly, uh, uh, the truth is uh, Uday's at a much earlier stage and is the, really the first person coming into a startup and trying to help it do design and do UX and, and make great products. And, and uh, so I don't want to steal a slender really uh, um, too much more than that. Uh, let me just give a little bit of the, the spiel. Um, Uday is the director of UX at Cloud Physics, a big data startup where he's bringing beauty and soul to data visualization. That sounds like a great mission. Um, and spent nearly five years as principal designer at Citrix. Um, he also has background at Oracle, Adobe, Frog, Cisco, Netflix, um, and, uh, uh, and has spoken at South by Southwest, UX, UX Australia, IXDA. Lean startup, I sell it. So I think uh, everyone can agree that we're uh, lucky to have Uday uh, Gajendar. Did I say that right? Um, probably not, Gajendar. Um, <laughs> speaking with us tonight, uh, I, both of my bosses are Indian, and I still can't pronounce Indian names that well. Um, uh, so anyway, please, <laughs> a big hand uh, for Uday. All right, well, thank you, Christian, for that. And let me actually get to the main slide. It's supposed to be the title slide. All right, excellent. All right, can everybody hear me? That's the first question. Excellent. I just want to point out this was not from last night. This is from six months ago. Uh, I think when I first joined with Cloud Physics, and I realized I'm embarking upon a fascinating and amazing wild-eyed journey. Um, so hey, um, it's great to see this crowd. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I got to say, it truly is an honor. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for this honor to be able to speak here at Park, a legendary place in its own right. Um, and as Christian said, um, it came about through a fortuitous coincidence of commiseration, um, out of which came some thoughts around some insights and lessons of what it means to serve as a director of UX in a startup environment. How many people here are actually working in a startup environment right now? All right, quite a few, quite a few. How many of you, those of you who are in a startup, are the solo designer, the team of one? All right, you got a, one hand thrusting up proudly, yes. All right, we got a couple over there too. Okay, excellent, that's great, that's great. So what I will spend for the next 45 minutes or so um, is you know, re relaying a story, and I realize this is a little bit unusual, perhaps is a profoundly rare opportunity here at Beikai to relay more of a personal retrospective of what has been accomplished in the past 100 days uh, as opposed to a specific design method or research technique. Um, this is a little bit more of a personal story in which I will be sharing insights, lessons, some anecdotes, maybe even a few regrets um, along the way, which I hope will inspire, um, inform, and enlighten all of you, and hopefully a little bit of entertainment as well. Um, in terms of the journey, as I said, the journey is very much still in progress. This journey consists of two major parts. The first part concerns, of course, the evolution and development of the product experience in consort with the development of the company strategy and so forth. The second part has to do with more about what the journey represents. And I think many of you who are in a startup environment or even a big corporation for that matter, if this is your uh, first time or early on in your career, that journey of evolution and self-discovery of who you are as a leader and a design leader at that, right? Um, and by the way, when I say design, I do encompass you know, actual interaction design, visual design, UX, research, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so I'm just using it as a general catch-all for now. But there is something about that evolution of yourself and that self-discovery and awareness that comes about through kind of the, the grist of the churn and so forth um, and I'll, I'll be imparting a few lessons. So there are two parts of the story. 
I'll take about 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to power through a few slides, um, show you some examples and so forth, and then we'll conclude with a Q&A session um, as usual. Sound good? Yeah? All right. Cool. All right. Great. First, let's talk about startup. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I go to like a cocktail party or my relative's house, which is not a cocktail party, um, I, I'll bring up the startup and I'll say, you know, I'm working at a startup. And thanks to pop culture and popular press and media, there are certain notions that come to people's minds about what is a startup and what kind of environment has Uday landed himself in. After over a decade of being at these accomplished companies like Oracle, Adobe, Cisco, Citrix most recently, is it something like this? Where there's nothing but an ever, never ending confluence of caffeine, Nerf guns, coding, rolling in the Benjamins, and then sprinkle a little bit of fairy dust for good measure, just to make it all fun and exciting, right? There is that kind of notion, at least whenever I talk to people and I say, yeah, I'm working at a startup, it seems to be this fuzzy notion of what, what, what does that mean? What kind of environment is that? There is a little bit of a mythology which has been created, partly because of us, I think us being in Silicon Valley in the bubble in which we live in, um, and when you see stories about how certain apps, I'm not going to mention their names, get $19 billion in funding, they don't really do much. Um, and then there's also related to that, there's a little bit of a fantasy and a mythology around the UX of that, right? Those of you who come from large corporation and so forth may be wondering, you know, oh, or even if you're fresh out of school, oh, wow, I'm in a startup. We could start fresh with a blank slate, clean canvas. We could start, do it the right way, the way it's supposed to be done. We can empathize with customers. We can ideate. We can brainstorm and, you know, we got to prototype, get some customer validation, A-B test the hell out of it, get tons of data. Oh my God, the data. Can you imagine what we can do with that data? And then, of course, we're all going to be happy and, you know, be jumping up and down for joy. You know, you can pinpoint some of these folks. Here's the product manager, his engineer, his marketing, your sales, you know, and there's the UX guy and so forth, right? Everyone's all jumping up and down, leaping for joy at the enthusiastic response of doing it the right way, the way it's supposed to be done, right? Well, there's a little bit of a myth and a fantasy to that as well. There's a little bit of fairy dust you have to sprinkle on that too, right? So what is the reality? What does it really mean to be in a startup situation as a solo UX person and driving for a vision um, that can uh, uh, enable the company and so forth? Well, first of all, when it comes to startups, like many of you may have heard, you know, Steve Blank, right? Steve Blank is the entrepreneur, author, and coach. Uh, we're grateful to have him, you know, he's here in Silicon Valley and so forth, uh, written some fantastic books. He talks about a startup as being a temporary construct, an organization whose purpose is really to search and find that product market fit. It is temporary. But while it is temporary, you're going to go through these convolutions of a roller coaster ride. Right? There are lots of emotional highs and lows, ups and downs and swings. There's also a notion of blur, the speed and intensity, the frenzy of trying to deliver a, uh, some kind of MVP, minimal viable product, out to the market and gather the data and so forth. Right? That's what a startup is. Right? Um, it's not about the caffeine. It's not about the money. It's not about uh, the fair. I know. I know. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. I'm sorry. But, but hang on. Hang on. In cloud physics, just to explain the current situation I'm in, because again, I'm trying to debunk that myth about being at a startup. What does that really mean? It's not a bunch of overhyped hyper-caffeinated kids rolling around on, on scooters or whatever. Um, at Cloud Physics, this is the more mature end kind of startup, right? Um, it's been around for about three years, just achieved Series C funding, about 15 million. I think we got about 27 million total. You know, it's founded by seasoned veterans from places like uh, VMware, uh, uh, Veritas, Sun, Cadence Systems, and so forth. So these guys know their stuff, right? These are PhD data scientists, right? They know their stuff. They're not rolling around on scooters, right? Um, and they have a purpose, they have a mission in terms of translating the, the impact or the ability of using big data tools and technologies to improve the performance of virtual data centers. I rehearsed that 10 times. Talking about cloud systems is always complicated, isn't it, Christian? Where's Christian? There he is. Um, so does everyone understand virtualized data centers? You're really good with that? Okay, cool. Um, I, I don't want to get too, too detailed into that, but the whole point of it is to provide insights that can drive so-called smarter IT, right? Smarter IT decision-making, 
to improve the performance and monitoring of those systems. That's all I really want to get into at that point. I just want to mention the point that as a startup, this is a mature end of a startup, right? Um, and it's moving forward in its own kind of progress and its own path. Um, the other part of the reality of the situation from a UX point of view is that things are already in mid-flight. When I joined, there was already a product. So we're not kind of scrambling like, oh my god, what are we going to build? And how are we going to do it? And all this kind of stuff. There was already a product. In fact, there were already a handful of customers. Um, and this kind of represents that existential quality of being a designer. You are thrown into a situation. And I think that is true for a startup, agency, corporation, right? even for consulting. Right? You're often brought in because something got effed up and you've got to like, help fix it up and so forth. Right? So that is the reality. You are thrown into a situation and you've got to make sense of it. You've got to transform that reality into something purposeful and based on a vision that is idealistic and so forth. Um, and this was kind of the case here, just to kind of quickly run through it. You know, we got to log in for a web-based SaaS application. Um, there was a dashboard of sorts, with, which has these cards. Oops, should be using this pointer. Has these cards. Each card represents a different feature, a different tool, if you will. Think of it as a Swiss Army knife with all these different blades and, and so forth, tools and implements that you can use to monitor and tweak the performance and configuration of your data center. That's all it is. And then you click into a card, and then you basically get this view of some charts and graphs and some filters. And that'll help you make some decisions about what to do. Buy more servers, you know, increase the RAM, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right? That's basically it. Now, if you notice, these are screenshots of the actual coded production product. These are wireframes. These are wireframes that are production coded. This was the state of the product at the time. I was brought in to help up-level that quality of the products and help us in that search and that discovery of the right product market fit. This is already mid-flight. Deadline's already set, timeline's already made. That's kind of the reality of that situation. It is representing a multifaceted challenge. What are those facets? Well, one, it's product functionality, as I indicated. Um, there are literally hundreds of features. Each card represents a different feature. Um, there is a strategy and a roadmap that is already kind of evolving and in flux. There's pivoting, right? We pivoted towards storage analytics when I joined around mid-March. Um, so I had to kind of take that into consideration, try and understand what that means in terms of arriving at PMF, product market fit. Um, and of course, team and resourcing. That's another challenge. I am the resource, right? I am the solo designer. Now, we also are blessed with a fabulous uh, UI dev team that's an offshore team. Um, so we're able to work with them uh, so it's been incredible working with them to help execute the design. But there are some challenges, you know, in terms of the, uh, uh, the time cycle for communication, right? There always is that. Um, and then, of course, just try to find designers, you know, who can help me out. Um, and then finally, just in general pragmatics, time and money, right? This affects every design situation. Um, there are already deadlines set. Uh, there are these kind of two-week cohort analysis and release cycles already in motion. Um, uh, you know, don't want to disturb that, which had its own purposes. Um, and then the money, right? I mean, you know, we already kind of made a certain amount, right? We don't have never any money, right? So that's always kind of a pragmatic concern. There are additional challenges as well. Now, how many of you work in enterprise software? Oh, wow, quite a few, yeah. Um, so I, then these challenges should not be too new, right? I mean, this should be pretty obvious and fairly uh, familiar. The fact is you're dealing with very complex uh, concepts um, around data, you know, data center virtualization, at least in this case with VMware, ESX, all those kinds of things. Um, and then, of course, the different kinds of users, right? Um, you're not designing for grandma, unless grandma is an infrastructure admin specialist, in which case I would love to talk with her, um, because we could use that information to help us drive our personas, right? Um, so there are certain kinds of folks with to cater to, the architect, the admin, and so forth. Very different set of personas. Um, and they're kind of, kind of uh, difficult to kind of always work with, at least try to understand their needs, their goals, and the purposes, and how they do the work they currently do, which is like this, right? This is what I call the desert of the real, because this is the reality in which they work in, right? It's sad, I know, but it's true, right? I mean, there is this confluence, this amazing array of products and services that are trying to meet the needs of IT admins and infrastructure uh, analysts and so forth, and this is what they get. Right? Tons of charts and graphs. I'm not sure if a lot of it's meaningful. I'm sure it's heavily functional. That's great. Um, and these are always lovely with these kind of traffic patterns and so forth, with the red, the red and the yellow and so forth. And you know, folks use them, right? People get used to them. And it becomes a habituated kind of act 
of, 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 of leveraging these to try to achieve some semblance of an optimal solution, right? We know it's not optimal, right? As human beings, we know this, right? We, we, we adapt ourselves to unideal situations, we create workarounds, and we just make it work for us, and then if you use this stuff for like months and months and months, oh, it's fine, right? Why, why do you need to fix this? Yeah, it's perfect, right? I love having garish red blocks of color screaming at me, it's fantastic. Um, but the fact is, if you remember Paul Rand, what he had said, the public is more knowledgeable, more familiar with bad design, with what is mediocre than what is novel. The novel is treated as threatening or dangerous, right? That's a huge challenge for someone wanting to introduce something that will lead them forward in a more positive state. So that, that is a huge challenge in itself. So, you know, all right, so I'm like reflecting upon all of this. You know, I joined this company. You know, I just left this prominent position. It's been five years as a principal designer. Uh, fantastic support from the CEO and, and the SVP and so forth. I was, you know, the leading uh, evangelist uh, groups and, and, and workshops and seminars and so forth. Fantastic time. And there was this moment of total panic and freak out. Oh, my God. Where am I? What am I doing here? Right? This is that existential moment where all your insecurities, your anxieties about yourself as a leader and what you can do really come out, right? Um, and this is kind of real too, right? I mean, this is kind of addressing and just kind of confronting that reality of who you are and what you can do to help improve that situation. And so I had to take stock and kind of step back a bit and consult this guy who says, you know, remember in uh, Empire Strikes Back, he said, you know, you have to unlearn what you have learned. In the course of a decade of working at a variety of corporations, I learned certain best practices and techniques and approaches. Citrix, I learned how to do evangelism, uh, uh, enabling innovation methods and so forth through workshops and seminars um, with a fantastic crew of people. But this is not that. I don't have 50 people. I don't have an SVP of customer experience. I don't have um, you know, all the other trappings and implements of previous situations. So I got to unlearn. I got to disrupt myself, in a sense, before I can disrupt the product or the service I'm trying to innovate. Right? That takes a lot of deep, uh, deep uh, uh, retrospective analysis. Um, and so you know, I spent some time thinking about it. You know, here I am coming in as a director of UX. What am I trying to accomplish? What is it I really want to do? And so I set a mission for myself. My mission at Cloud Physics is to bring beauty and soul to big data. It's a nice tagline, right? It kind of works, right? I can use that at cocktail parties and so forth. Um, that's really the purpose of it, right? Uh, and I do have a very specific meaning behind beauty and soul. I don't want to get too much into it, but my beauty, I refer to uh, this kind of articulated sense of story, style, performance, and utility, and how it all comes together in an artful arrangement. Um, by soul, I refer to emotional resonance, and that is that resonance that you feel um, at a visceral level, right? but also at, at a, a, a reflective level, um, at an emotional level. I think it's the levels that Don Norman has articulated in his books. Um, but along with that mission, there is a way to operationalize that mission and bring it to fruition. So what is that? It's design discipline. Now, when I was at Citrix, I was very much an advocate, and many of you have seen my tweets and Facebook posts and blogs and so forth have noticed I was a major advocate for design thinking. I still am. There is much merit and much value to that process and approach within certain contexts. I just wasn't quite convinced yet it's appropriate in this particular context. Not yet, not yet. There's still much work to be done. I'm dealing with production coded wireframes that are trying to serve as, it's like a minesweeper kind of thing, trying to look, look for the, the, the product market fit. Um, and so I realized I need to institute design discipline. Um, and I'll talk more about that, and a sense of excellence and make that a rallying cry culturally within the company. Which kind of leads to UX strategy. OK, so what, what do we do as UX strategy? What do I do, right? There is no we, it's me, right? I mean, I got to figure this out. But there is a we that has to work with me to figure that out, right? Now, the typical notion of UX strategy, we're all going to get in a big room. We're going to spend like weeks and weeks and weeks. And we're going to kind of diagram all this out, right? We're going to set some milestones, some anchors, some criteria, and work towards that goal and so forth. Well, you know, it's a startup. We already got deadlines. We already got timelines and, and uh, certain actions in motion. We got to keep moving forward. So by strategy, it's really about doing things, right? It's that bias towards action. I think many of you are familiar with that from the Stanford D School and really bringing that to bear. So what I'll talk about in the next few slides 
is my playbook for that UX strategy of how you can bring things to action. Right? The first thing, upon some ponderance about what it is I'm trying to do and what is the best way to achieve that, is by saying no. Now, I know this kind of contradicts the whole Stanford D school, yes, end. But yeah, you got to say no, but. Because you've got to define your contours and the boundaries. Otherwise, you will go insane and be fragmented. So by saying no, it really is, this is my boundary. This is what I am going to focus on. I am going to focus on the products and the certain aspects of that product. You know, I'm not going to go into all the details. But there are certain aspects of that product that are higher priority than others in terms of achieving product market fit. When it comes to matters about the website, about the logo and branding, um, uh, marketing collateral and so forth, I politely declined. Um, we have a, a, a fantastic person who's leading those initiatives. I'm happy to chip in with some perspectives and thoughts and ideas, but by no means can I offer deliverables on that. I have to focus myself. And that was the first step towards establishing design discipline. By saying no, you establish a frame of respect. Uh, but this guy clearly is focused on a certain area and wants to achieve progress in that area. Um, and that's, that's the first step towards achieving design discipline, or at least promoting it. Um, the next thing, conduct a UX audit. Um, so this was one of the first things I did. I think it was like week two. I just assembled the entire team, get everyone in that same room. Um, yeah, the E team, the product team, engineering team, whoever can be there, just get into the same room, order a whole bunch of pizza, and let's just power through the whole app. From login, well, actually from sign up, registration, login, go through the entire product, at least the main features, you know, the main cards, you know, we have the card deck model, um, and then um, uh, really make that a very participatory environment so that everyone feels comfortable contributing, yes, with stickies and markers and so forth. Um, and I actually stayed silent, or I try to stay quiet as much as possible, um, and really allow everyone else to kind of suggest areas of improvement. Um, and Noble, uh, or novel ideas, which are noble. Um, so th that's a very important thing. Have that UX audit, capture it, track them as UX debt items. So that goes a long way towards creating that participatory environment. The other thing is teaming up with sales and marketing. This is a big one that I learned directly while I was at Citrix. Making sure that you are connected to the people who are connected to the customers and who can get you that access to those customers. Right? With sales, you know, these are the folks, or this was the guy, it was one guy, <laughs> we have now expanded, um, who was doing demos of this product for potential customers. And I saw how hard it was for him to demo this and realized, I got to make this guy's job so much easier. How can I do that through a UX perspective, right? Improving the login, improving the IA, and so on and so forth, right? And working with marketing. Because with marketing, yes, they're defining the website. I said, no, I'm not going to touch that. But I need to understand what, what those messages are to make sure there's a copacetic relationship between the product and the website. Does that make sense? Um, so teaming up with sales and marketing is crucial. Also, by the way, with sales, I've been very fortunate um, that our sales team has been extremely open with um, giving me access to the customers and allowing me to call them up, send emails, and do user studies and so forth. And I'll, I'll show some, uh, some of that. Defining design principles. You know, it takes a little time to do this. It takes a few weeks, right? Uh, this is based on consultation with various members of the exec team, my own kind of thinking and creative uh, kind of thought process, and also just recognizing that, yes, I am coming here as a person who is respected as um, a UX professional, as a director, um, and who is valued for that sense of conviction, that sense of purpose, and that sense of vision, you know? I don't want everyone else to kind of come up with like their own values and own beliefs and all this kind of stuff and have some big, long, committee-driven consensus. It's about me coming in with a posture, aligning everyone around that posture, and achieving success with it. So for the design principles, I set it on the four Cs. Very easy to remember, right? You got clarity, or sorry, craft, uh, making sure that there, yes, I know, uh, making sure that there is craft and highly crafted um, uh, pixels and code. It goes all the way. There's clarity of the data that is being represented since we are a data-driven application. Uh, we've got to make that the hero. Choreography of elements across time. This per pertains to animation, but also choreography of workflows and how that evolves over time. Charisma, right? We want to make this product charismatic, breathe some life into it, make it feel attractive, that people want to use this on a daily basis. Because our users, as I indicated, are living within the desert of the real. We need to provide that oasis of sustenance. And that's kind of the goal with that, with the charisma. It also speaks to kind of a uh, higher level macro 
uh, value system of creating something that is like a trusted advisor that provides targeted value, very specific value, whether it's like data store contentions or VHCS calculator costing. Don't worry, it, it really exists. Um, and making those things really powerful, but also very seamless, right? These are the higher level principles. And these are the principles I expect everyone on the team that includes sales, marketing, engineering, uh, and myself. I hold myself to these standards as well to make sure we, we, we support them. So principles are essential. Don't be a blocker. Yeah, you can be a theorist about the principles, you can talk about the principles, but you can't be a blocker. You gotta roll up your sleeves, dive right in, and actually make stuff, right? As I mentioned, there are already timelines uh, in progress. There was a product in mid-flight. Features are rolling out. All right, you gotta dive right in. You gotta understand these features in a real-time basis, try to grok their meaning, and then try to extract and express um, uh, the, what, what, what that is in terms of the information graphics and so forth. And a lot of it is a lot of stop gaps, you know, right? I mean, I confess, I did a lot of temporary fixes, a lot of band-aids, a lot of stop gaps, just to get it out the door, right? Because we're tracking to that very tight schedule. That's kind of reality, that's what you gotta do, right? Try to do the best you can. Um, but this forced me, by getting deeply into it, to understand what this product is, how it functions, what its purposes are, and ultimately try to arrive at a design language that we can kind of eke out of it, right? So as we're working on tables and filters and trees and all these other kind of constructs, charts and so forth, I'm able to suss out, oh, there's a pattern here, many patterns that are emerging. So it turned out to be a blessing, actually, when they were kind of pushing me to, you got to get there, you got to start designing stuff, we need that icon, we need that button, right? It was a great way to learn about it and to extract some patterns that could be very useful. And just a few more shots here about evolving the design language. This includes multiple states of the buttons, uh, some charting language there, uh, different states, error states, null states, um, different elements um, that could be used and reused and repurposed. Um, because that was another part of this, is to create that library, a component library and so forth. Um, and also some color, color language as well. So evolving the, the design language is essential. That's kind of a parallel thread that naturally merges out of getting deep into the pixels, not being a blocker, but enabling progress. The other part of it is creating that beautiful vision. Right? This is partly why I was, uh, I was hired, right? what I'm paid for, right? is to help assess and suggest here is where we can be. Right? This is that moonshot. Let us overcome the horizon of that desert of the real that our users are unfortunately suffering with right now and overcome that and let's strive towards this. Right? Some kind of beautiful vision of the future that suggests something that's charismatic, that there's clarity of data, and so on and so forth, resonating with the principles. Also, bonus, give it a cool name. I call it Snow Falcon. I don't know what a Snow Falcon really is, it just sounded really cool. It excites people, it inspires people, it becomes a motivating kind of element, right? Um, so I'm a little bit serious about that, right? Um, give it something inspirational and aspirational because it helps guide the team, the engineering team and PM team towards something that they can believe in, they can rally around and feel proud of what they're building, right? Despite staying up all night or all weekend and so on and so forth, right? We want everyone to share in that success. Um, so present a beautiful vision, and um, you know, give it a name, give it a good name uh, they can be proud of. Uh, I haven't forgot about research, by the way, in case you're wondering, research is essential. Um, and we're tremendously fortunate to work with Lynn Polishuk. If you don't know her, she's based in Vancouver. Um, uh, uh, she goes, uh, Lynn, Lynn UX is her, her Twitter handle. She's fantastic, highly recommend her. Um, but don't steal her away from me yet. Uh, we still have a lot of stuff to do. Uh, but she has been fantastic in helping us define the personas um, and working out some user studies and so forth. And again, this is another vehicle for defining a UX strategy that other people can be bought into, product management, engineering, marketing, and so forth, sales especially, providing the customer contacts. Always be doing research. I'm always calling up customers and saying, even quick 30-minute calls, you know, we're doing, working on this new concept, you know, you just ask like five questions. You could ex extract so much valuable information within just a five minute call, or a 30 minute call. Um, so always be doing research. All right, so UX strategy, in a sense, that summarizes the playbook of the strategy I've been deploying um, at Cloud Physics. It is really a sense of interconnected threads that are woven in various ways, right? 
I'm not as much a believer in going into a room and saying, okay, guys, let's you know, sit in this room for like eight hours and hash out a strategy and not leave until it's done. Right? Strategy is emergent. It evolves over time. It requires guideposts, like a vision and some principles and so forth, to lead things forward. But it requires, requires iterative actions over time. Um, actions led by the designer, in this case me, but those uh, involving other folks to be participate and chip in and contribute to this, right? So tr strategy is something that is evolving, right? That's the kind of the challenge. And by the way, if you notice, the playbook involves research, visual design, interaction design, IA, all those elements that we constantly talk about, but they evolve organically in this kind of emergent way, framed by the vision and the principles, right? Okay, so just to kind of wrap up what I call part one of the talk, which is more about the product and design evolution, this is where the product started, March 15th. Uh, yes, the Ides of March. Um, rather fortuitous on that day. So this is where it was, uh, a little bit of, you know, kind of a wireframe, like I said, production coded wireframes. You know, it's very functional, very raw and skeletal, uh, but the functionality is there. This is where we are today. Um, so, or a couple of weeks ago, so freshened up the login screen, give it some uh, personality, some character to it, uh, suggest that you, uh, an invitation to the user, you're entering a world of cloud physics, uh, of data-driven smart insights. And then, of course, the product itself with the deck view, cleaning that up, um, offering more, oops, so, uh, some more uh, signals here uh, about alerts and so forth, cleaning up this area, and then also cleaning up the profile panel. So slowly but surely, we're making progress. Right, uh, and this is in no small part because of the fantastic efforts of our engineering team. Um, so that's what's happening now, and this is what's coming next. Um, as I mentioned, with the Snow Falcon vision, really surfacing that data, bring it forward, uh, so it tells a meaningful story. Uh, and we'll be introducing something called Grand Central soon. Um, we'll be revealing that or unveiling that at VMworld, which is another uh, way of expressing uh, uh, data-driven insights and so forth. Okay. All right, so that concludes part one. I'm going to take a little sip of water. It's really hot with these lights here. I should wear my baseball cap. Okay. All right, let's talk about part two, which is more about the journey of the self uh, and reflections on what it means to be a design leader and what are the challenges therein. Um, in the course of working on a product, you are obviously brought under certain stresses and pressures. Those pressures kind of result in, you know, uh, opportunities and situations where you kind of emerge as you truly are, right? Um, I'm being a little abstract, but let's just hop right to it in terms of what, what is it that I truly learned and what is that posture that I was bringing to bear as a design leader. Um, when it comes to leadership, it is a little bit of an abstract concept. When you read HBR, McKinsey, Rotman, and so forth, all kinds of definitions abound. The framework I kind of subscribe to um, is this notion of it, leadership is about influence. Um, influence can happen across multiple vectors within an organization, whether it's a startup or a corporation, even an agency. What are those uh, vectors? Well, it's vision, process, strategy, culture. The four biggies, right, you often contend with and deal with on a daily basis. Um, and if you notice, going back to the UX strategy playbook that I presented is, is kind of what that's based upon, right? Driving a vision, articulating a strategy that is emergent, shaping a process around design discipline, um, and then, of course, naturally, hopefully, impacting a culture and a cultural attitude about how design can function within an environment, right? So that's what leadership is. Now, there are certain ways of going about doing it. For me, you know, I took a certain posture on certain, thing, on certain uh, topics. The first and this is something I'm beginning to realize as a leader, that I think any leader, um, if you're a leader at, I don't know, Pinterest or Facebook or Intuit or Citrix or whatnot, you're going to make big bets, right? Um, these are the bets that you're placing, not just for your career, but the bet that you know, we will make success in certain areas, we'll gain ground, excuse me, in certain areas. I made big bets on wrangling complexity uh, by virtue of good information graphics and so forth and instituting beauty or having beauty inculcated into the product. Um, a big belief in visual design 
and having that emotional responsive quality to it. Um, that was a big bet, right? Am I winning on that bet? I don't know, right? I mean, we're still in progress. We're, we're gathering user feedback. So far, it's positive, it's optimistic, but you know, we'll see, right? Uh, the other part of the, kind of the posture of leadership I'm taking is dealing with that now versus next, right? You're constantly in the blur and the chaos of we got to ship this out or we got to get that release out. We got, you know, we got a special customer. We got to push that little feature out. Um, okay, fine, fair enough. You got to do some stock app measures and so forth, but keep tracking it back to that big vision of what's next, right? Um, I'm not stopping either one. The now versus next tension is necessary and perhaps healthy in its own way. Um, because it keeps that dialogue going, um, but it's essential, right? So I'm not taking sides. It's, it's both happening together uh, through the sprints as well as the strategic vision. Instituting or at least introducing a new vocabulary for startups. As I mentioned in the beginning, I deliberately decided not to bring in the vocabulary, the ethos of, quote, design thinking. Not that it's not valuable, I'm just not sure it's valuable in this particular context at this particular stage of the life cycle yet. It's fantastic in certain corporate structures and other organizations. Instead, I'm is, uh, or, or, um, introducing a language of kind of very tactile, uh, tactical, uh, um, action-oriented things. For example, tracking the UX debt, right? Having a sense of a job to be done. This is from Clayton Christensen. Um, what is the job to be done by this feature, right? And who does it serve? Right? Is it worth the extra steps or whatever to, uh, to get that feature in? Um, being hooked, is there a way we can hook people in to help drive towards product market fit? These are more action-oriented concepts that I think speak towards um, how do we get to that product market fit, right? But still supportive of a design-oriented thinking and approach because you're constantly thinking about who is the customer, what their needs are, how we can triage that given our, um, our resources and pragmatics. Uh, and then finally, just do it, right? You just got to demonstrate and role model good behavior. As I mentioned previously at Citrix, you know, I played a role of an evangelist who is leading workshops, seminars, classes, and so forth, really constantly kind of teaching and preaching, if you will, right? Uh, and that works for a certain audience. That's fantastic. That's great. A lot of folks got, got value out of it. But in this particular case, because we're running fast, because we've got certain urgent matters um, at stake in terms of releases, that's probably not going to fly. So instead of teaching and preaching and trying to get the schedules right, can we all get in one room, I'm just going to go do it, right? It's a little bit of that whole forgiveness, not permission thing, right? So what do I mean by that? For example, sketching. Uh, our product manager, one of our PMs, loves to just you know, come up to me in the middle of the day and just say, hey, Uday, we got this fantastic feature. Um, it does X, Y, and Z, and A, B, C, and some point one and some point two. And I'm like, well, hold on. Let's just go to the whiteboard. Let's just start sketching this out, right? And as we do that, raise the questions about who is this really serving? What is the value add, right? Role model that behavior. And now what has happened, like a few months later, we've got a bunch of whiteboards that have been put up. Um, and people are actually just going to the whiteboard and sketching. Oh my God, it's amazing, right? Um, even that small thing, right? And it's just role modeling behavior, right? Um, a couple other ones. Um, about making it visible. Sketching is important, obviously. Putting stuff up on walls. Now, I know this is obvious to us, right? If you're in certain environments, this is just a natural thing to do, particularly in an agency and so forth. But here, you know, when people get kind of uh, kind of uh, lasered into their own particular problems and projects and so forth, it's hard to kind of surface people up and take a look, right? So just put stuff up on walls. If it's rough, if it's raw, if it's, it's crazy, and invite people to participate. Put stickies up there and put comments and so forth and force those conversations so that everyone feels like they are a member of designing what's next for this company, right? And achieving PMF, right? It's not Uday being the superhero that's going to design everything for everybody, right? Everyone has to participate and be a part of that conversation. Um, and so just you see some examples here, some, uh, some stuff around user profiles. Uh, we, we did a little business model canvassing kind of activity there. Um, and then you see some other um, imagery and screenshots and so forth. But it's just making it visible so everyone's aware. And also, it gives confidence and credibility to you as a leader so that everyone's like, or not like, oh, design is this kind of mystical black art, dark magic kind of thing just happens in Uday's head and pff, it just comes out after some bourbon or something. Um, it's not that, right? I mean, it's obviously a much more articulated process. There are moments where there's a little bit of that creative magic, 
but I want to expose the results of that magic and have them participate, and then we roll it back up again. Um, the other thing is communicating, right? Hopefully not like Calvin and Susie here yelling at each other, although they have a deep mutual love for each other. Isn't it true? Um, you just always got to be communicating and be in environments or situations where you have that communicative posture. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, things like daily scrums or stand-ups, if you're applying agile uh, methodology, that is your opportunity to get visibility into what's happening and also express your questions or concerns or advice and guidance. Right? Office hours, this was something that came about because um, I was getting pestered and harassed throughout the day, like 20 times during the day, and I'm like, I can't design. Um, so <laughs> what I did was I carved out a block of time every day at 4 p.m. Uh, where I am open to distraction. And I set myself up in a little war room, and people would just come by, ask me questions, you know, talk about features, you know, raise issues, cr critique my design, whatever it is. But I block out an hour just for that, right? Um, and that's proven uh, pr pretty useful. Sprint retrospectives, again, if you're doing agile, even if you're not, this is actually a really good uh, technique. At the end of every two weeks, get the you know, product owners and engineers into a room, and let's just kind of hash it out. What worked really well over the past two weeks or however long your sprint is, and what did not work so well, what are some areas of improvement that we can make for the next sprint going forward? It could be UX, it could be sales, marketing, you know, whatever the issue is. Let's just capture that, and let's, let's make sure we're all in agreement about it, and we have openness and transparency, transparency around that. Um, again, that's another way of creating that kind of cultural bonding and connection. Um, holding some other design sessions, big think is what I call them. Um, it's kind of the bigger brainstorms. Okay, why do we have cards? Can we think about other metaphors, other models, you know, those kinds of things. Again, invite everyone's feedback. And then giving tech talks or, or design talks. Um, you know, I'll be ramping up more of those. It's just another way of, of getting people excited about design. Always be communicating. It is absolutely essential, um, uh, being a design leader, to communicate as much and as often as possible. Um, all right, so what did I really learn in terms of the last 100 days of, of achieving the progress that has been made with cloud physics in terms of UX and in terms of engagement with members of the team? Um, lots of interesting lessons. I mean, they're all kind of interrelated, and they're probably what you would expect. Um, you know, yes, I have to play multiple roles and wear lots of different hats. Um, I brought one of those hats here. You know, this is my favorite hat. Um, it's, it's crazy. Like, when you, when, you, when you wear all those hats, there's a lot of context shifting. Um, and there's a, a little bit of a temptation to step in a little bit and suggest, well, maybe engineering should, oh, wait a minute, I'm actually not an engineer, uh, or I'm not marketing, I'm not product manager, right? So you got to be a little careful, right? You got to check yourself a little bit, know your limits, what you can and cannot do, offer polite suggestions. It's always a good thing. Um, yes, I am empowered to make the call, and I hear that a lot. It's Uday's call. Awesome. Oh, my God, this is fantastic. This is like the dream of every designer, right? But hold on, I don't have all the information. I don't know everything about this product. It's an incredibly complicated product. Um, I need to tap into the domain experts. I need to tap into our users who are our users, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, I gotta consult with folks. Um, yes, I'm head of UX, but it doesn't mean I have all the answers, right? I think this is true for any of you who are functioning in this role. I can't have all the answers, that's impossible, right? I saw this fantastic tweet the other day. I forgot who sent it out, um, and it was quoting uh, oh, shoot, I forget who I was quoting. But it was about um, being a creative leader in an organization does not mean that it's the one person with all the ideas, right? Instead, that it's a person who will create a culture and environment where other people can free, feel free to contribute um, and feel comfortable and confident in contributing those ideas, right? So that's how I kind of see myself. I can't be Superman all the time, you know, can't be superhero. There is a cost to doing that, right? It affects your quality of work. It affects um, just who you are as a leader. And I think perceptions of that, you start creating bad habits of dependencies. You don't want to create that, right? It's a dangerous, slippery slope. So you've got to be careful with that. That goes back to that no thing I said at the very beginning. Create your boundaries. Define those boundaries. Um, and know how to calibrate between leading and following. That's a tough one for me, to be honest. Um, you know, there are times when, yes, I need to be that leader and provide suggestions and direction and focus. And the other times, you know, I just need to step, step back a little bit and take some direction from other folks who know more about the domain, who know more about the business, um, and so forth, who know more about the technology. 
And so I just need to kind of step back, listen, and process, absorb, and then reflect back, right, accordingly. So that's, that's kind of a tough one, right, for me. Um, and maybe for you, I don't know. Um, the biggest lesson I've learned, or one of the big ones, is yes, you're caught up in this dramatic environment of speed, intensity, potentially chaos, um, hopefully a structured kind of chaos, and you're trying to make sense of how do you prioritize all this work that has to be done. I can't be Superman, I can't do it all, but a lot has to get done because we're kind of at that stage in our startup cycle. Not too crazy, but you know, crazy enough. Well, there's this framework that I've been applying to help me triage all the demands and requests and pressures. What are the needs in terms of short term? What are the goals you have to accomplish in terms of long term? And long term could be defined in terms of quarterly cycles, right, every three months. If you notice 100 days, it's roughly three months, roughly one quarter, right? Um, the risks that could affect your goals and affect your needs, right? Risks could be something like um, we, we may have a few UI engineers or a few engineers, uh, sorry, um, uh, sales folks or whoever, maybe out for a vacation or maybe someone's out sick or, um, or we didn't make enough funding and you know, we need to uh, pay our researcher and so forth. Those are risks that can impact actual outcomes, tasks and outcomes. And then finally, what are those asks? Okay, based on the risk, based on the goal, what is the ask you're making of your superior? You know, I report to the VP of engineering. We also have, of course, our CEO and so on and so forth, the E-team. Um, so this is a nice little framework I think could be useful in any other context as well, not just startups. Regrets. There's always some regrets. By the way, this is not me either. I don't dress up as a stormtrooper at night. Um, but there are naturally some coulda, woulda, shoulda kind of stuff, right? That's just a natural part of leadership. It's like, oh man. Maybe I push too hard on that Snow Falcon visual design system because I really want to bring it to life. It's just so, it's like emerging in my head and I just want to like get it out there and just make it real and amazing. Maybe I push too hard on that, you know? Maybe I should have done more use of research up front. You know, I don't know, right? Maybe I should have said no to that real-time design stuff. I could have backed off and said, no, I can't do that. I got to back off and just think about our users and think about our vision and so forth, right? Um, I could have forced a very strong lean UX model. I don't know. Right, but you can't second guess yourself. You can't do that whole uh, what is it? Ar armchair quarterbacking and so forth. Um, hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, that's kind of how it is. That's just reality. Um, but you're going to get get yourself caught up into a kind of a tough cycle, a vicious cycle, I think, with all the regrets. Another part of it is kind of what this guy said. Y'all know him, right? Don Rumsfeld, right? Secretary of Defense, former Secretary of Defense. Now, he made this interesting comment, and it got lampooned for, but it's actually kind of a very serious theory of complexity and so forth around the knowns and unknowns. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that whole thing there. You can read that yourself, but you, you get the gist of it. Uh, it. It really just points back to the whole issue of being a designer thrown into a situation that is fraught with complexity, right, ambiguity, and you're trying to find those moments to insert beauty right, wherever possible and feasible. Right? That's just the nature of the situation. All situations are like that, the constraints and contingencies. And your job as a design leader is try to figure out how to triage that. Now, I gave you that framework about needs, goals, risks, and so forth. That's one way of dealing with it. And also the other thing is, and this is why you can't get so caught up in the regrets, I can only design with the data and resources I have at that time, not with what I wish I had. Right. Some of you may remember the original quote, right? Just kind of paraphrasing, right? Um, I don't have 50 people. I don't have these massive, amazing labs and so forth. And I'm sure a lot of you probably don't either, right? There's only so much you can achieve. There's only so much you can do. Um, and it's just kind of coming to terms with that reality. That's a fundamental part, not only of leadership, but I think also of maturity, <laughs> right? It's kind of the, the natural part of growing up and being that kind of responsible adult who's recognized these are the realities, these are the situations. This is what we have to deal with. Now, how do we kind of work through that, right? I think a junior designer, a younger designer might be a little more passionate and idealistic and like, damn it, why can't we just do this? You know, and kind of throw a little fit. And I've done that before, believe me. Um, you know, and then you realize, wow, now I'm in this position. I can't do that. I've got to figure out a way to make it work. I have to be that role model to sales, to marketing, to product management, to engineering, right? And so this is kind of the toughest lesson of all, I think, for me. It's OK to just do good enough. It really is okay. Because there's always V2, V3, V4, right? You're iterating, 
right? We're still trying to get PMF, product market fit, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, some of you may remember this guy uh, or heard of him, uh, Herb Simon, design theorist, Nobel laureate, um, has some fascinating theories around design and also uh, decision making. Um, one of the biggest things about decision making he, he spoke of um, is this notion of satisficing, that is not optimizing, which is pursuing the ideal state, but instead satisficing given the constraints and contingencies you are dealing with, right? You have to satisfy, right? You gotta do the stopgap, you gotta do the temporary fix, the band-aid, right? But this is where I admonish, sternly admonish, the engineering and product management teams. It is just a temporary fix. We will come back and fix that. Uh, and we will track it as UX debt. And we'll bring it back to the Snow Falcon or whatever that vision is, right? Um, that's where the discipline comes in. So yeah, this is cool. You know, you gotta satisfy, that's just reality, you gotta do it. But we're gonna come back to the, reality, uh, to the vision and to, the, to what that represents. So satisfying, that's just kind of part of, part, of the, part of the deal. So again, coming back to leadership, right? I mean, if you want to be a leader, if you want to know what leadership is really about, you got to go out there and be a leader. You know, I think that's the ultimate lesson of all, right? You can read all these books and papers from you know, Harvard Business Review, McKinsey, Rotman, all these guys. And they're good books, good papers and stuff, you know, nice ideas, nice theories. But to really understand it, to really bring it home, um, you just got to go out there and do it and try it yourself. And I think all of you in this room are leaders, right, in your own way, in your own scale and scope of things, right? Maybe you're not director of UX or VP or whatever. It doesn't matter. In your own way, you can embody these characteristics and be that leader that other people can follow, respect, and thereby increase and amplify the influence of user experience within your organization, right? Um, it's not for the faint of heart. It's hard. Leadership is hard. It really is. Um, but... You know, I have this uh, three, three words here, confidence, conviction, and ambition, CCA. No relation to the university. Uh, but CCA, the idea is be confident in the expertise and judgment and knowledge you bring to bear to the problem. Have a sense of conviction, a point of view that you bring to the table. That's why you're, that's why you're there. That's why you're being paid, uh, paid to do what you do. And then have a sense of ambition, right? Lead the company forward. Lead the users forward to a destination they have not yet seen, right? Do not let them be stuck in that desert of the real. Just because they're used to it doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. You can move things forward. And you ha it's your job as a leader to keep pushing. Um, all right, so UX team of one. A little bit of a final word on this one, and then we'll roll into questions uh, shortly after this. Uh, what does it mean to be a UX team of one? And you know, is it a valuable thing? Is it a right thing to do? Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a thing that happens, right? Um, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put that one up there. OK, that was kind of lame. All right. Yeah, it can feel like a little bit like a trap, right? You're kind of stuck there. Oh my god, I had to do all this stuff. Visual design, interaction design, UX, research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? I got to do the whole diagram, the whole grid. But at the end of the day, being a UX team of one is the prime opportunity to demonstrate not only your knowledge and expertise, but your pride. Your pride for the profession, your pride for the craft, right? This is you demonstrating to everyone else that yes, this is a valuable, uh, uh, valuable thing to do. Um, it can be done. I don't think it is sustainable, quite frankly. Just speaking of the pragmatics, um, you know, at some point you have to scale and grow, and you got to get other people to help you, and so on and so forth. I'm making that argument with my superiors, believe me. Um, so I can become a UX team of two at least, uh, or three. Um, but being a team of one, it is a fantastic opportunity, right? Um, you're making impact. You see the, the immediate rewards of those impact. It is deeply gratifying. It is amazing. It is enriching. Um, it's an exhilarating ride, you know? So take it for what it is. Have, have the most fun with it. Um, and just coming back to the journey, the journey of the product, the journey of the company, the journey of yourself as a leader, um, it's a fantastic thing. Um, and I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to go through this. It is iterative, and I hope e each of you, as you go through your journeys, continually iterate on that, right? Um, and until you get awesome, right? That's what it's about, having a lot of fun along the way, be awesome in your own way, and so forth. Um, and I believe that is it. So I wanna thank you. I hope this was useful, insightful, and inspiring for all of you. Um, and I think we'll go into questions. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Okay. The other one. The other one. Yes, yes, yes. Got it. Oops. Okay, so um, and just real quick, so I do have my contact information over here. 
Uh, feel free to just take a quick uh, uh, photo of that. These are some of the books that I, I have on my desk. Uh, these have been very useful uh, resources for me. Um, to help spark stimulation around questions and stuff, uh, because I always find myself at the end of a talk and there's a big Q&A sign, I'm like, well, I don't know what to say. Um, so here are all my slides. So if this will help spark and do a little memory recall, uh, feel free to, to point out to that. Okay. Do you have a system for actually tackling UX debt? Because I feel like my PMs and engineering team always want to work on new features. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the system we use um, is, in terms of the technical system, it's JIRA. So we use JIRA um, as a way to track technical debt, or sorry, UX debt. Um, and we do actually put the, the tag UX debt on various items, and I think there's a prioritization or ranking order for it. Um, so that's how it gets tracked technically. Now, the other part of that is um, kind of the social and political aspect of, okay, when do we talk about the dead items? Because we're racing to get these features done, right? We're still working that out. Um, I, you know, we've got you know, the point of contact for us. We have the VP of product design or product management. So I'm working with him to make sure we get that rolling and somehow Maybe it's like a 1%, 2% every sprint, a little bit, a little bit at a time. So, yeah. Cool, great question. Yeah. Yep. Uh, when you're working with your overseas team, did you uh, create a style guide for them of sorts? Not really, um, because things are kind of in flux and evolving right now. Um, I think in terms of the style evolution and direction, what's happening with that is it's emerging out of the mockups I provide. So just to give you a sense of the workflow, I do my mockups in Fireworks. They're layered Fireworks files. Um, where possible, you know, I can extract the graphics and so forth, create an assets folder for that. Um, and then I put all of that on Google Drive. Uh, so we use all the Google services. And then I provide links to that because it's, they're live documents to our overseas team. So they have direct access to it. Um, we've also given them licenses to Fireworks so that they can uh, go to town with fireworks and, and, and kind of rip up the files themselves and so forth. So that's kind of the process we've been doing. But yes, we need a style guide. It will eventually get there. <laughs> oh, sorry, here we go. Um, hey, Uday, thanks for sharing the playbook. Sure. It's actually my first time being exposed to all this UX stuff, so awesome. really great. Um, great. Good. Really Thank informative. You. So, so I am wondering, in terms of like, you know, so I don't know how the process works, interfacing of you between other functions. Mm -hmm. How do you, a, you know, get time for the developers? Like, do you work with the PMs to get on the roadmap, or how does that process work? Mm -hmm. And then se second question is, how do you prove the value to the other functions, other peers, and even to your manager, right? Mm -hmm. Is there like a dollar figure you're saying, with all these UX changes mm -hmm. in six months, I promise you, increase <laughs> usage. You know, like, I'm wondering, yeah, like, I, how I, do I, you, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah. do that? Well, okay, so in terms of the first, first question about um, working with like, you know, PM and engineering and how do I get on the roadmap and so on and so forth, it's a constantly ongoing arbitrated process, if you will, in the sense that I'm constantly working with our, uh, our PM team, constantly with our engineering team to try to figure out their priorities. We're kind of shifting and evolving our structure a bit in our process going forward, um, post VMworld, sorry, just went into lingo there, um, in which um, I will work directly with our VP of product management to ensure that I actually have the power to create UX stories. Um, so sorry, a little backtrack. So we have the system called Jira. So as part of Agile, we have stories, right? So each story is essentially a task. Um, and that task could be something like create search field, right? Um, I am actually empowered to create UX stories. So for Snow Falcon, I created a whole series of UX stories around Snow Falcon, um, which requires further breakdown and so forth. From there, we go into UI stories or UI implementation tasks that our offshore team takes, uh, and that's arbitrated by a UI architect on our end. Um, so all of that, we need to get in sync with our product management folks. So that's happening. <laughs> that's all I can say at that point. Uh, sorry, your second question. Oh, proving the value. You know, I have to say, I've been extremely fortunate. I think it was a big reason why I joined Cloud Physics. Um, uh, the leadership team, I didn't have to prove the value. I didn't have to walk in and say, okay, dollar sign value of each of these features and all that kind of stuff. They get it. Um, I think they get it at a gut level. They get it at a level of we need to get product market fit. We recognize that user experience is essential for a startup, um, and particularly in this particular space, to, to make ourselves distinctive. Because as you saw, the desert of the real really is like that. Um, so I don't have to do all that, which is fantastic. I think the only kind of dollar value thing I have to argue for is, okay, 
hiring or uh, uh, subcontracting out some research work is going to cost X amount. What would we get out of that? Okay, we're going to get you know, an understanding of our buyers. Understanding of our buyers will then traffic back to the sales guy, which would then impact this. It's a little bit of a discussion, but it's not this big, heavy, I don't have to create Excel spreadsheets. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry, we're capturing, we're recording all this. Sorry. Sorry. This. Yeah. Um, let's say you're stuck in an enterprise that maybe doesn't have that level of appreciation mm -hmm. for the craft, right? right? How do you begin to get, you know, plant the seed there? Yeah. And then also in your case, you were saying that you report up to the VP of PM, which is great, but also if that isn't already set up, that infrastructure is in mm -hmm. place, what's your advice yeah. on building uh, that? Just to clarify, I report to the VP of engineering, um, but I work with the VP of PM as well. Um, so in those contexts, yes, it is very difficult. Um, that's where, quite honestly, this is what we have done when I was at Citrix. You know, we did all these evangelism stories and so forth for other companies who are trying to do that. You know, we, we would point out exemplars in the marketplace, right? Zappos, right? Virgin, right? Um, Nest, right? Dyson, et cetera, right? Point out those exemplars and say, look, these guys are putting X amount of dollars into design and research and so forth. Look at the outcome of that. Uh, Robert Bruner, who's the author of the book, Do You Matter?, does an exceptional job in terms of pointing out additional examples of what works and what doesn't, in terms of framing that dollar cents uh, kind, of, kind of value argument. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. Martin Neumeier is another one who has a really great book, um, The Designful Mind, I think is what it's called, um, or Designful Organization. Um, so those are some references with some examples that can help you. Um, if you don't have that kind of support system, that kind of structure, it all comes back to constantly just pushing the argument of, okay, here are the examples, do we want to be like them? You know, who else do we want to be like, right? Um, it also comes back to, you know, if you make these improvements, if you make a little bit of a hypothetical argument, right? If we make certain improvements in certain areas, what do you think, what do you hypothesize the gain would be? Sign-ups or logins or downloads or whatever it may be. And that's going to force a conversation about, well, wait a minute, are your numbers right? Well, I don't know, but I guess what? If we do a study, we can figure out if these numbers are right and if we can get better numbers. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Oh, hi, Andy. Yep. Hello. So you mentioned something about getting people to accept challenge, or novel designs. And I was wondering if you could probably have some inspiration in terms of like a novel design that you created or a novel feature, and the client was like, that's exactly what we wanted. We never thought about that before. Yes, we're going through it right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's that whole Grand Central concept, right, which is um, this kind of window shade thing coming down from the top that exposes all this cool data visualization graphic stuff. Um, and it's interesting how that started, if only because um, the conversation pre prior to that was there was a sense amongst sales, marketing, and PM that we need to have a landing page. Like I'm talking about landing page. I'm like, what are you talking about landing page? Yeah, we don't need a landing page. We need a landing zone. So that's when I just went out and just on my own just kind of sketched out these concepts, literally pen and paper sketches, and I translated to wireframes and so forth. And I just kind of showed them to folks. Um, I you know, copied my sent to the CEO, copied a few execs, and said, okay, I think this is what you mean, because this will drive traffic in this particular area, and it will surface up our value prop in a very specific, distinctive way, right? And it triggered light bulbs, like, oh my god, you're right, this is what we, we should be doing. Let's make it happen. Um, so, yes, <laughs> it is happening, it is possible. Could, but, you, could yeah. you clarify what you mean by zone as opposed to landing page? So a landing page, um, well, let me talk about zone. A zone is one particular part of that page, which um, uh, presents uh, critical information in a, in a certain way um, and drawing users' visual attention to that space. But it's on the page. It's on the main, the main page. Okay. That makes sense. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you were talking about owning the walls. In, in, in any environment you've been in, do you have any suggestions for how to do that with distributed teams? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we dealt with this situation back at Citrix and some other places, Adobe and so forth. You know, it all comes back to, um, are you saying the, the design team is distributed, the product team? What's, what's distributed? Uh, with, um, so within product management, within product marketing, uh, there is no design, I am design and development. Mm -hmm. And then within development, um, all of those groups have multiple people in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. Even product managing, management isn't together. Yeah, yeah. So it's really, and uh, four locations yeah. around the globe. Yeah, so I've actually done this before where, you know what, print out like 
buy different posters and you send them out to everyone um, and really get them to post them up or even try to go to those sites and try to post them up as much as you can. And how do you do that within a two-week sprint cycle? Well, you don't do it for that two weeks, okay. right? I mean, you're, you're looking long-term, right? So if you think about it for the long-term, okay, maybe for this particular sprint, we're focused on, I don't know, some kind of data table. I don't know. Um, okay, well, here's the data table. Here's the design and so forth. Blast it out there. You got FedEx. FedEx a tube of posters to them, to all these different people, and suggest, here's the design. I'd love for you to post these up. And so that in six weeks, we're going to have five or six different posters of all these different elements that we can all kind of be sharing and talking about, right? I mean, that's one approach. Yeah. You've got to get a little bit kind of... Now, I speak from a rebellious posture. So you can probably tell. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Um, you just got to get out there and do it, right? Be that guerrilla kind of activist and just, like, get stuff out there, right? Um, so and you, the, you had the funding for that? Yeah. I don't, have the the funding. Funding. I don't have the funding for that. That's what I'm asking. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll do an I electronic mean, version of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can try that. Try the electronic version. Um, create a wall. Create something that's online. Maybe that's using some free space like Dropbox or, or, or Google Drive and have people go to that. Um, you know. Those are, I know. Yeah. They're, they're, they're hard. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, oh. Uday. <laughs> oh, hey. Um, so um, I have two questions. First is yeah. um, we know that like um, in design reviews and design critique processes that you yep. really would benefit from other designers' feedback. Yes. So now as UX team of one um, and yeah. reporting to VP of engineering, yeah. how do you handle design reviews and then how do you get exactive buy-ins? That's yeah. my first question. And then second yep. question is um, right now as you are the UX owner of the product, mm -hmm. Do every new features go through you, or you only handle part of the new features going into the product? Uh, second question is yes. Um, yes. Um, uh, as, as I understand it, everything has to go through me, and I have to bless everything. Okay. Now, that blessing could be five minutes, because I could just like look at it and be like, you know what, it's fine. It's a, it's a you know, move a button or whatever it is, right? Other situations, it may be much longer and a much more involved process, and I need to understand the context and use case. So yeah, but yes, everything goes through me. Um, in terms of the first question for design reviews, well, you know, it's kind of interesting. Yes, we kind of have sort of have design reviews. We do need to get it more formalized and much more disciplined about that. Um, one of the things I definitely miss being a team of one is that sounding board of other designers and other folks with other perspectives. Uh, we've been fortunate to have a couple of folks come over uh, to join me uh, who are more UI front end engineering folks that have UX kind of thinking to them which has been fantastic because they will raise all kinds of issues while I'm designing that I haven't thought about. Um, so yes, I need a sounding board. Uh, I'm trying to reach out to folks in the community, uh, which has been helpful. I don't want to name names, but there's some certain folks that I just kind of reach out to on, on a regular basis and I'm just showing them concepts and so forth. Oops, don't tell my boss. Um, and then the other point about design reviews, they're very loose at this point. We need to get something much more formal and structured. And my hope is, with those reviews, we'll have, it'll be very, um, very uh, contained, structured, and organized with capturing of items that go back into JIRA and all those kinds of things. Yeah. So stay tuned. Journey in progress. We're working on that one. Thank you. Anybody else? I want to I wanna make one comment back to you, which is that you may want to look up online uh, literature about ROI of UX or ROI of user experience, user interface, mm -hmm. yep. because there's a lot of literature, several books, and a bunch of articles that use that term. Yep. So yep. it yep. may help. Absolutely. Got another question at the top. We, in December, we had uh, Scott Birkin here to talk about the year without pants, which is when the year that he spent yeah. working in Automatic, which I've, is I've a 100% yeah. distributed organization. And I, yeah. I mean, would that be a, a severe challenge for you, given your, the style that you have for, for um, collaborating with people? Uh, you, you, you know, owning the mm -hmm. wall, you answered that question. But I mean, would it be possible to do this with a completely distributed team? So this is my opinion? No. If only because what I'm trying to accomplish, what I'm trying to deliver in terms of the vision and making that vision a reality, it takes people on site to make that happen. Um, again, that's my opinion. That's, you know, that's kind of the situation I'm in. That's what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, we have an offshore team, and we're working with them. That's one cycle that we can accommodate, we can support. Um, I'm not sure we can add additional cycles of additional people who are distributed, just given where we are organizationally and structurally. So. 
that's just me and cloud physics. Um, uh, while answering to that lady, you mentioned you do a uh, lot of uh, peer reviews or you know uh, the expert reviews. So, mm -hmm. is there a scope of doing usability testing with the real end users, and uh, what is the uh, viability of doing research into your project cycle? Like, you know, does your management uh, accept to that kind of concept of doing the typical user research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about research for a bit because the research approach, admittedly, is very guerrilla style, right? Um, so it does consist of me calling up, you know, uh, uh, users, you know, I'll send an email and so forth, we'll set it up. We'll have literally like a 30, 45 minute call, right? I actually did this just this past Friday, I had two of them, back to back, in which I showed some of those Grand Central concepts and just gathered very high level feedback um, about the content, about the prioritization of that content, um, the interaction model and so on and so forth. I showed some concepts, um, you know, we use GoToMeeting to kind of review those concepts and so forth. And I got the feedback, right? And then I gauged that feedback um, and then sent a report out to the team um, highlighting, okay, here's where there's some pros, some yays, that's great. Some areas where we need to work on it, you know, tweak some stuff. So it's a very guerrilla style. So management is supportive of that um, because it doesn't really cost them anything and I'm just doing it. Um, I don't have to ask permission. I just kind of make it happen. Uh, with regards to working with Lynn, Lynn Polishuk, who's based in Vancouver, you know, that's a little bit more of an effort in terms of getting the budget um, and going through an SOW process, which is a statement of work, having the management team review that. And I had to convince them, yes, this is valuable, and here's why it's valuable, right? Because this will give us certain insights that will help me deliver a design that will achieve these targets, right? So there's a little bit more legwork that has to happen, but yes, I can, I can convince them of that, yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, first of all, thank you so much for your, for being here and giving yeah. this talk. Yeah, um, you bet. So my question is like how do you balance between the, the different opinions? Like some people of course any everyone you talk to will have mm -hmm. some opinion or some idea about yep. said feature, whether yep. it's good or bad. So how do you balance and like find the middle ground or find the ground where where you go with it in the in the end? Yeah. Um it's tough, right? There is no prescription or formula or recipe for doing that, right? In those kinds of cases, A well, I'll talk, I'll talk about it this way. So yes, everyone has an opinion about design. That's just fact, right? But let's separate that a bit. There's some subtleties there, right? There's a confusion about design equating taste and aesthetics and style and all that kind of stuff. I have, for better or for worse, taken a somewhat of a dictatorial stance on that to say anything that has to do with style and taste, um, uh, the aesthetic character, that's my judgment because that's what you're paying me for, right? Until we get created director and all that kind of stuff, right? Now, if it has to do with the positioning, the, the, the prioritization, is it, is it working right? I actually take light out of that conversation and have, us, have a, a conversation around work. Is this working for our user? And does this work for our user's use case? Does that make sense? Then the opinion cycle actually kind of slows down a bit. And then it becomes much more about, OK, let's have a good debate around, is this working or not for what we're trying to do? Does that make sense? Um, Again, people will offer their opinions and their perspectives. Go back to users. If at all possible, can we do some quick user studies, get some feedback? Um, but we can't just rely upon users all the time, right? At that point, then we have to kind of figure out, OK, if we were to make this change or pursue this approach, what do we lose? What do we gain? Both in terms of the coding effort, well, design effort and coding effort, um, and then potentially would this impact our product negatively if we were to do this? You know. It's an arbitration process, right? But the key thing is separate out that whole taste to like thing, so it's more about the functionality. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so I've been working as a front-end engineer for almost uh, six years by now, and I used to work with a lot of uh, information architects and user experience professionals, mm -hmm. and sometimes business analysts who do a, a little bit of wireframes. Sure. So, and I'm also about to be, uh, begin my uh, a masters in HCI. So, after, do we think after two years that uh, can I work as a uh, hybrid skill set uh, kind of person? Like, I, I mean, mostly I was worked as an engineer, mm -hmm. and if I do uh, HCI after two years, I mean, after two years, do you think I can continue as a, a person who can work on hybrid areas where I can contribute uh, both at the um, user experience perspective as well as the uh, coding part and the backend side? 
I don't know. Do you think you can do that? And no, just asking. <laughs> so since you met with a lot of personal, I mean, you met half. Well, no, I, I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be kind of silly or glib with that. What I'm saying is that's up to you. You have to decide. Do you want to do that kind of a thing and play that hybrid role? Mm -hmm. Do you believe you have what it takes? Because what's going to happen if you get into a situation like this, you will be split up in a sense in terms of time, in terms of the projects and responsibilities and priorities and blah blah blah. People are going to be pulling at you in different, you know, different ways. So you're going to have to kind of figure it out. If you can do that, can you arbitrate that kind of process where people are kind of pulling at you in different ways? Because I can tell you, um, if you're a hybrid who can do both HDI, UX stuff, and code, you're, you're like golden, right? Everybody wants you, right? I want you. you know, it, but you've got to figure out, is that right for you? Is that what you want to do? Can you maintain that balance between the two? Right? I would say yes, but I mean, I don't know you, so you'd have to figure that out for yourself. <laughs> no, since you had, you know, more, you know yeah. worked with a lot of persons, you might have some more experience than, you know, sure. you see a lot of unique skills. You know, oh, yeah. Right, in the oh, streets. yeah. I mean, I, I know that. I can tell, having been here, you know, 12 years in the Valley, when you see folks, when I see folks who can do both those hybrids, oh, my God, they're my best friends. Right. I love them because they're able to execute things in a certain way. They're able to visualize and anticipate, do all those things so, so amazingly well, right? Um, but I also know they're precious. And I don't want to burn them out. I don't want to overwhelm them. Okay. I want to make sure that they feel productive and they're doing what they want to do. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, and let me put it this way. So assume you have a role of uh, UX work as well as uh, a back and friend engineering work, mm -hmm. UI engineering work. So you have three persons uh, with uh, three different skill set, like user experience guy, mm -hmm who works only on the user experience side, okay. and the guy who do only visual design part, and the other guy who works on both the skill set. Okay. So which one you prefer? If they're really good at both skill sets and can deliver high quality at both, you know, I'd probably lean towards that, mm -hmm. you know, just given kind of the constraints and conditions of a startup environment, living in money, blah, 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 right? But they have to prove themselves that way, right? So. I don't, I don't want to <laughs> set up false expectations. <laughs> Everyone's going to be like, oh my god, you know, uh, tr try to do that, but yeah. Good. Good. Hey, Hi, how are you? I? Good to see you. Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, giving the, the talk. It, uh, it brought me back to right here, strangely enough. Oh, okay. uh, one of my first yeah, design yeah. jobs was at a, a startup that spun out of Park. Oh, uh, and nice. I briefly okay. had a, a desk in the hallway here, uh, and you know when I had trouble printing something, I would <laughs> ask the fellow who invented the laser printer. Well, I'm um, sure that was fun. <laughs> just, nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so you know I was employee number eleven there and got to be the wow. design team of one. Awesome. Uh, and be the jack. Excuse me, the jack of all trades. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, my question to you is: You're still a design team of one. Mm -hmm. How will you know? when it's time to bring on designer number two, designer number <laughs> three, and so on. Oh, it's been time. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, honestly, um, I think as soon as the Snow Falcon vision came to, to, to light, um, and major pieces of it have started kind of trickling in with those UX stories, and our team has been building them out and so forth, I'm now realizing, OK, now it's time for me to kind of step out into a different role and have some other folks kind of jump in and take that and carry it forward, right? So I can work on some of these other things. So yes, it is time, yes. However, let me temper that real quick before everyone gives me like your resumes and stuff. Um, <laughs> we, still gotta, we still gotta finalize some of the budget and all those kinds of things because as you can imagine, not only am I a team of one for UX, we have a team of one in marketing, we've got a team of one with back, uh, back end DevOps and so on and so forth. So there are lots of teams of one. So just wanna temper that, but yes. Hi, Uday. Uh, great Hello. presentation. Thank you. So uh, you spoke about the mission of uh, bringing beauty and soul into what Cloud Physics was doing, right? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about how much of the product you have to know, this being an enterprise data analytics product, how much does that uh -huh. help you, or how much do you need to know of that as a UX designer? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, because I think that speaks to a broader concern that I have. Um, I didn't get too much into it, though I kind of joked a little bit in the beginning about creating products that actually solve real problems. Um, I, I mean, it's great that a lot of you are in enterprise UX, which is great. And I hope there are more people that go into enterprise UX. But I know there's a uh, hesitancy or reluctance to do that. Enterprise, I'm sorry, would I say that? Did you say enterprise UX is great? 
Oh, no, no, no. I think it's great that there are people who are doing UX, enterprise UX. Yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, enterprise UX is fantastic. It's awesome. Come on. Iterate till you're awesome. Um, I realize there's uh, uh, reluctance and hesitancy to go into enterprise because of the dense um, uh, technical knowledge that you, you think you need to know, all the stuff about VMware or Citrix or Oracle or whatever it is. My first job was at Oracle, uh, and then I worked on a bunch of other stuff. But what stuck with me were two things that I learned from my, my mentors. The first was question your assumptions, your dependencies, and your expectations. That's true for any piece of software, whether it's, I guess, WhatsApp or you know, VSX, IA, or whatever, you know, VMware stuff. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, remember that in any piece of software, whether it's web, desktop, mobile, et cetera, et cetera, any piece of software, you're always dealing with the same situation. You've got some objects that have some attributes, right? Uh, and there are certain conditions in which they function. There's states and persistence of those states. There are certain um, interactions you can take with them. Those objects interact with other objects. And there's a workflow. That's all it is at the end of the day, regardless of what you're dealing with, right? I know that sounds a little convoluted. But not as convoluted as taking a class on VMware, right? Uh, I haven't even done all that stuff. Because at the end of the day, one of those PMs, I guarantee you, and they'll tell you this, when those PMs come to me and say, oh, OK, we've got to do this, or the engineer says this and this, I don't understand what they're talking about. But I reframe it back to them and say, OK, you've got an object, has certain qualifiers or parameters or attributes, has to do x, y, z actions. Those actions are only available in certain conditions. And then there's a workflow between object to object to object. Got it. Now, how do I communicate that? How do I convey that with an interface? Right? That's it. That's all I need to know. So yeah. So yeah, I think anybody can master any of this stuff, but you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be a domain expert in this. That's why you have the domain experts, right? Lean on that. The clock on the wall says it's past nine. Oh and my God. I want to thank you so much right, for well, thank you. this lovely talk and everybody for participating. Thank you.